Hi everyone, this lecture is about inferences about means. We learned about inferences about proportion, and this is the version for means. So it's basically, the basic idea is similar and same. Most of them are same. So it'll be easy. So in last lecture, we learned about hypothesis testing and null hypothesis statistical testing, right? And the meaning of the p-value. So the meaning of the p-value, people are many times, oftentimes, confused about the actual meaning of the p-value. So we learned about central limit theorem for mean already. So basically, for quantitative data, the sample mean is a y-bar. If we assume that we repeat the sampling again and again, we are going to get the many y-bars, right? And the mean of that is going to be population mean, and then the standard deviation is going to be sigma population parameter standard deviation divided by square root of n but how can we know sigma we don't know about that therefore we are using sample standard deviation s and that is the standard error and using the critical value for z star uh, this estimate plus minus margin of error uh, that is calculated with z star times standard error of the mean work well for large sample data but it's not work well for small sample data. There is William Gossett, actually the chief experimental brewer for the Guinness Brewery in Dublin, Ireland. I'm going to explain what the t-test is. This famous t-test is from Guinness Brewery. Interesting. So his sample sizes were very small, often three or four. And he found that when he used the standard error, s divided by square root of n, the shape of the sampling model a little bit changed it. So the dashed line shows the, the normal model, Z distribution, and the solid line is William Gossett observed. So that's called T. So the Guinness company did not allow the, the employees to publish, so he published a paper on the pseudonym student, so we call it student's t-test. To understand the t and t-test, we need to really understand what the degrees of freedom so Gazette's sampling distribution, even with the small sample size, is always bell-shaped, but the tail was a little bit heavier when he used the small samples. This was related to a parameter called degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom is the concept from mechanical engineering, and that is basically the number of, number of points that are free to vary. And in statistics, is the number of values that are free to vary after we've estimated parameters. So for example, if we have n data points, and then we have estimated the mean, y bar, then uh, we, if we know m minus 1 data points, we should be able to figure out what the nth value is, because we know the mean. Therefore, the data point has only m minus 1 degree of freedom if, if we know the mean of that sample. So if we know the true population mean, mu, the sample standard deviation should be this, divided by n, because there is no bias. But given that we don't know mu, the population mean, we are using sample mean instead, right? So it becomes y minus y bar instead of mu, and divided by something. And then the data value tend to close to their own sample mean, not the population mean. So the sample data points should be closer to its sample mean than population mean. Always, that is the case. How much? That really depends on degrees of freedom. So then, uh, this deviation from the mean, sample mean, becomes smaller. That is why the standard deviation is always smaller than true standard deviation, if we divide that by n. So we need to fix that bias by dividing this deviation by m minus 1 because we are dividing this value by a smaller value the s becomes larger so making the standard deviation larger so fixing the bias okay when sample size is small the difference becomes much more important so interestingly dividing by m minus 1 solve the problem so this is the sample actual sample from Gossett's simulation so that was each sample was n equal 4 so each time he get the value from 4 samples and this is a computer simulation with the sample size n equals 4 
and when normal model is used it's just narrower and it's more wider as I showed you then Z dashed line is Z distribution and solid line is what Gossett actually observed because of that the T distribution was born that has the heavier tail than Z when sample size degree of freedom is small after we figure out the T value everything else is the same with the mar estimate plus minus margin of error the confidence interval for means is y bar plus minus critical value times standard error of the mean and critical value was z previously but this time we replace z to t to figure out what the t value is we need to know the degree of freedom it depends on the degree of freedom so the t distribution the shape of the distribution changes over degree of freedom so that's why we need this de degree of freedom information to figure out t value so the change is t instead of z and students t model are unimodal symmetric and bell shaped similar to the normal and as the degrees of freedom increases the t models looks more and more like the normal and the largest difference is observed in uh, degree of freedom is very low okay and the assumptions and conditions are really same independence assumption but it has one more assumption that is normal population assumption because students t is not going to work uh, for small samples when the data are badly skewed as we saw in this example when the sample size is really small it's still skewed right so the the sample size should be large Help to use the t model with the small degree of freedom we need to check the distribution of the population but the problem is we don't really know the distribution of the population so uh, if the if the sample size is larger than 40 or 50 t methods are safe to use in most of cases and if you are certain about the, the distribution of the population uh, you can use t methods with a small sample size as well we talked about this how to interpret confidence interval but i'm gonna repeat this again so let's say a college student sleep hour the mean of that is 6.64 and 90 percent confidence interval is 6.272 to 7.008 and what we cannot say first is uh, we cannot really say something about individual students using the confidence interval because confidence interval is about the mean right so for example 90 percent of all students sleep between 6.272 and 7.008 hours per night it's it's wrong because we don't know uh, it's not about the individuals and percentage of proportion of the students who sleep between these hours and also what we cannot say is we are 90 percent confident that a randomly selected student will sleep between 6.272 and 7.008 hours per night we cannot say because it, this is uh, again about the individual student and what we cannot say the mean amount students sleep is 6.64 hours 90 percent of the time because it's about interval not point estimate so what we can say is 90 percent of intervals that could be found in this way would cover the true value now we can do the t-test one sample t-test for the mean so this is the method that is really popular null hypothesis is mu is mu zero so many times we test against zero value but you can use different mean values t value can be calculated with this so y bar minus mu zero divided by standard error of the mean this is really same with the z value where standard error of the mean is calculated with uh, sample standard deviation divided by square root of n when the conditions are met this statistic follow the student t model with n minus one degrees of freedom and we use that model to obtain a p-value so I'm gonna give you an example in 2004 a team of researchers published a study of contaminants in farmed salmon so the farmed salmon has some contaminants and fish from many sources were analyzed for 14 organic contaminants and the study expressed concerns about the level of contaminants found one of those was the insecticide Myrex which has been shown to be carcinogenic and is suspected to be toxic to the liver, kidney, and endocrine system. So it's bad. One farm in particular produced salmon with high 
levels of Mirex. So after those outliers are removed, summaries for the Mirex concentrations in the rest of the farmed salmon are, so the number of salmons and mean of the Mirex concentration was 0 0.0913 ppm. And standard deviation was this. And what does the 95% confidence interval was about uh, Mirex. And here degree of freedom is M minus 1, so 149. The standard error of the mean is a standard sample standard deviation divided by square root of n. So that is uh, this standard deviation and this n. So this is the standard error. And t star, the critical value, is calculated from uh, the table, or you can find the the p to t with the degree of freedom online. So here uh, we are using 149 degree of freedom and 95% confidence interval. So probability p is 90.95. And what is the t value for that? That is 1.976. It's similar to 1.96 z value, but a little larger. And the confidence interval for mu is y bar plus minus critical value times standard error of the mean. And so here, uh, this is the critical value and times 0 0.004, that is a standard error of the mean. And this is the 95% confidence interval for Mirex. So we can say I'm 95% confident that the mean level of Mirex concentration in farm raised salmon is between this value and this value. And now we are going to use this same example for the one sample t-test. So uh, as we said, we tested 150 farm-raised salmon and the mean concentration of Mirex was 0.913 ppm and the standard deviation was 0.0495. And the recommended value is 0.08 ppm. And the question is going to be, are farmed salmon contaminated beyond the level permitted by the, the Environmental Protection Agencies, EPA? And let's say the conditions are met. And the null hypothesis is going to be 0 0.08. So that's the recommended level of a Mirex concentration by EPA. And the alternative hypothesis is going to be larger than 0 0.08. And as I said, these data satisfy the conditions for inference. And we are going to do one sample t-test for the mean. So these are the values we have. So sample size, degree freedom, y bar and st sample standard deviation and we can calculate the standard error of the mean and t value is a y bar minus null hypothesis mean so this is the null hypothesis the mean from null hypothesis and divided by standard error of the mean that is 2.825 and that's basically based on this t, t distribution a t distribution based on this degree of freedom equals 149. And based on this t value, we can calculate the probability of this, and then that is 0 0.0027. Because this p value is really low, we can reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the Murex contamination level does exceed the EPA screening value. As we just saw the, the examples, the confidence intervals and significance tests are built from the same calculations. They are complementary ways of looking at the same question from two different perspectives. Hypothesis tests start with a proposed parameter value, so the null hypothesis, and ask if the data are consistent with that value. And confidence intervals start with the data and find the intervals of plausible values for where the parameter may lie. So start with the parameter and end up with data and confidence interval start with the data and end up with uh, parameter. The confidence interval contains all the null hypothesis values we cannot reject with this data. So they are basically same. Both use the same standard error of the statistic as a ruler. But for proportion, it's a little bit different because for the mean, we don't know the population sigma Therefore, we are using the sample standard deviation instead of the sigma, but in the test for proportion, the standard deviation can be calculated from the p. So we are using the p and q from null hypothesis. For the proportion, the standard error 
uh, for confidence interval and for hypothesis test is a little bit different. This is what I just explained. So standard error uh, for p hat. This is going to be used for confidence interval, and this is going to be used for null hypothesis testing, right? So this and this, they are a little bit different. But for the mean, they are same because we are using S for both cases. Choosing the sample size is the same with the proportion. So given that we have the margin of error by this equation, we can decide how large margin of error we want to have. But before collecting data, we don't know S, right? And also, without knowing N, we cannot calculate T star because it depends on the degree of freedom. So for standard division S, we can use previous studies or run a pilot study so we can get some sense of S. And for T star, we can use Z star instead if our estimated sample size is 6 or more. If the target sample size is smaller than 60, we can use Z star first and then finding N, then replacing Z star with T star for N and calculate T star correctly again. Or we can use multiple different Ns and then get the values and uh, choose the, the closest one. Okay, that's it for today's lecture. Uh, and if you have any questions, bring it to the class. And don't forget uh, to solve the quiz. Thank you guys. See you in the class. Bye.